Okay, well, while everybody's getting a seat, I want to welcome you to uh, the future of food, no small topic. Uh, so it's an updated look at Nourish's annual trend report. And just so I can level check, um, show of hands, how many of you have read the Nourish trend report for 2022 already? Excellent. Okay, so this will be all new for you. All right. Um, so uh, I'm Joanne MacArthur. I'm president and a founder of uh, Nourish Food Marketing. And I like to say that we are um, a full-service marketing advertising agency that just specializes in food and beverage. We know a lot about a little. Uh, and that gives us kind of a privileged view of the food ecosystem. We do a lot of original research. We do a lot of secondary research. Uh, across the food ecosystem. And so we started doing a trend report, I think, seven years ago. Uh, and uh, we've done it uh, every year since. Um, and uh, you can download the report. Um, I'll uh, give you a link at the end. I also have some uh, hard copies here in English and in French, so please help yourself at the end of it. Um, but, uh, you know, trends continue to build over time. We're not talking about fads. We're talking about those societal shifts. And so it's also useful to go back and look at our trend reports from the past couple of years that are also up on our website. Um, first, because I think a lot of those trends are still relevant and still growing, but also you get a chance to see, you know, if we really know what we're talking about as well. Um, but when we released our 2022 report, it was back in November, and it looked like we were just about to come out of COVID. <laughs> and we were going to, as a society, refocus on climate change. And then a few things have happened, right? We've seen rampant inflation, we've seen a war in Ukraine, and we've seen COVID kind of continue to bubble up again. So a lot of things getting very real, including climate change, right? Uh, we've seen it in Canada. Uh, we have dr drought in one part of the country. We've had floods in Abbotsford, uh, forest fires. So it's getting real, very new or very real. And I think there's this understanding that the planet's health and our health are now linked. Um, worldwide now, we're also seeing inflation, food inflation, 30% year over year. So some serious issues there. And also for the first time in our trend report, we talked about some generational divides because we're seeing some um, very different views of the world depending on which end you are of the generations um, in terms of whether you're more concerned about personal health or planet health. And with younger generations, Generation Z, uh, millennials, they're very focused on planet health, right? They are the ones who are going to have to fix this. Um, if they want a better life for themselves and for their kids. So if your product is targeted at these younger generations, uh, inaction on climate change is going to be a brand breaker for them. Eating food is not just about human survival, it's also becoming about the planet's survival. Uh, and so I just also want to say, because we have um, clients who are across the whole food ecosystem, all different commodity groups, producers, processors. We're not making value statements with it, this. We're just saying what we see coming because we want to make sure um, that our clients are able to prepare for the future, future-proof their, their business in some way. So it's a 40-page report. Um, I'm going to touch on, there's some agricultural trends as well, because we also have an agricultural practice. Um, but I'm just going to talk about the first few and give you a bit of an update since uh, we released our trend report in, uh, in November. And uh, I'm hoping we have 10 minutes at the end as well to have a bit of a discussion between us, answer any questions you may have. I always love that as well. So coming out of COVID, we are expecting more of a um, focus on the elderly and boomers. Uh, you know, we know that these groups are very much under-targeted. In fact, a, most food research doesn't even talk to consumers over the age of 65, and yet they are a massive marketing opportunity. And, you know, both boomers and seniors are looking for more functional uh, foods to support healthy eating. Uh, and most of them, especially coming out of COVID and the mess with long-term care, they want to age in place in their own home. And to do that, to achieve that wish to be independent, uh, they are willing to pay more for food and beverage that supports that mission. 
So whether it be you know muscle mass, skeletal space, uh, strength, immunity, vitality. So really think about health span rather than lifespan here. And done right, the payoff is there. Uh, so we saw Instacart. Um, they have a senior support line. And what they found is their initial customer service contact with seniors, yes, it takes about 20% longer on average than uh, people who, of younger generations, but they see a real payoff in terms of loyalty and repeat baskets with this group more so than others. So if you get them, they're very loyal. Um, that picture down there, that is a brand ambassador uh, for uh, SuperAge, which uh, is out of the UK. They call themselves the first super food targeting people over 50. And they use, um, you know, they use boomers as brand ambassadors, and they're there to help uh, other boomers achieve their bucket list through powerful nutrition. Of course, with COVID, we really saw digital adoption, you know, catapult about 10 years in the future, and it really pushed boomers and seniors, largely their kids, pushing them to get online. Um, so they, they're, uh, they've crossed that digital, uh, digital divide, but they still need some help. So if you can, simplify processes, bump up the font size, please, um, and make reordering just really easy, one click for this group. And consider using seniors as influencers um, on YouTube videos and even have them write FAQs, you know, seniors for seniors. They, they will understand a little bit better. And also think about how can you lighten the load at home. So they may not uh, have the same energy and cooking skills, but they still want that pride in, in um, preparing a meal. So can you develop a meal kit that supports this mission and allows them to finish it, assemble it at home, but still have the pride in saying that they made it. And the other thing is remember that today's boomer does not look like yesterday's boomer. You may have seen this meme that was going around on, on social media uh, portraying exactly the same age, right? Um, so, you know, boomers are going to fight aging like no other generation. So remember that uh, boomers don't look like, uh, like grandma used to look like at all. Um, so like it or not, boomers have most of the wealth in this society uh, and uh, you know, ignore them at your peril. They are an under-targeted group uh, and they are willing to pay. So are you able to develop new products? Are you able to reposition your existing products to support healthy aging? And as boomers switch into senior mode, you know, how can you offer those easy meal solutions that are going to allow them to stay, uh, maintain some level of independence and age in place? And uh, remember, grandma doesn't look like grandma anymore. And I say that proudly as a grandma of two. <laughs> so, you know, we're, we've entered an age of cynicism, and brands need to move from market to me to matter to me. And we've been talking about this trend towards radical transparency um, for a number of years in our trend report, but I don't think um, producers, manufacturers were ready to go there. But it's become table, table, spa uh, table stakes. Um, you know, that it's no longer a nice to know, right? Consumers are demanding that they know. And for the first time, we've seen um, the number of consumers who believe that Canada's food system is headed in the right direction has actually fallen for the first time. And for the first time, global warming, warming is in the top five of their life issues. So, you know, there's this rising demand for consumers to know the uh, story behind your product and to understand how everything was treated, whether it be the land, whether it be the wor workers, whether it be the waste streams. So how far back can you pull that curtain and invite them in? It's also, um, transparency is also really important uh, in terms of maintaining your employees and recruiting new employees as well. And that's critical right now as we're in a huge labor shortage. Um, so, sorry, forgot to put it ahead. So you can see things were falling uh, in terms of food systems. So if you want some inspiration uh, in terms of how some companies are doing this right, um, if you look at Local Line, they are an e-commerce platform in the US, and they connect local farmers, actually across North America, with consumers to sell the products directly, so you know who you're buying from. Um, uh, Ifinka is an app uh, that connects consumers with the coffee farmers who actually um, grew that coffee that's in your morning cup of joe.
And if you're in retail, check out what uh, Coop Italia does. They're the number one grocer in Italy. And they have given consumers the supply chain in the palm of their hands. With your smartphone, you just scan on the QR code for any product, and it takes you right through um, to, the, to the product uh, supply chain. And Walmart just recently uh, launched two labels under their Built for Better to support their sustainability goals. And Green Choice, uh, in the last couple of months, they have moved from a mobile app, which allowed you to make purchase decisions based on your values. They've now gone beyond that, and they've created an online, um, an online marketplace where users can shop from all the big U.S. retailers, so Walgreens, Walmart, Target, uh, and you're able to filter your choices based on your values. So purpose transparency is fast becoming table stakes. So how can you invite consumers in and build trust and loyalty? What stories could you already be telling about your processes that you're proud of but aren't sharing? A lot of times we take what's best about us for granted, right? Think about you know calling out um, antibiotic free um, on things that all, were always antibiotic or, or gluten free. So a lot of times we're too close to our products. We take that for granted. And uh, remember, you need to go beyond uh, a statement on your website. Uh, seeing is believing. So ideally, you could show um, photos, you could show video, or you can go as far as basically live streaming as, as some um, dairy farms and egg farms are doing now. You can actually live stream the conditions of uh, those animals. So a fun fact, how many of you know that veggie burgers and hamburgers were basically invented at the same time in the late 1800s? Uh, they show up in cookbooks uh, that around that time. Uh, so that, you know, this has been going on for quite a while. We highlighted um, in our 2018 trend report plant-based. Um, but what we're seeing is a, a bit of a fracturing now in that space. And since we wrote this report, you're actually seeing plant-based burgers, uh, meat, um, on decline, especially in quick serve restaurants, which is, um, you know, always an early um, uh, trend. And what we think is going to happen is we're going to see two ends of plant-based emerge. Uh, so you've got the one end, which is kind of science. It's excluded um, proteins, fat flavoring. And on the other end, you're going to have um, products that embrace the plant and talk about what's best about them rather than what they're mimicking, right? And so, you know, we, we, both sides are kind of doubling down right now. And... Uh, we warned um, in a couple of trend reports ago that the plant-based um, term was losing its meaning, much like natural had lost its meaning. Um, and we're seeing that continuing. Um, there was a recent study that showed um, that consumers don't believe, uh, a quarter of consumers don't believe that these meat alternatives are healthier uh, than the meat they're replacing. Um, but they are looking for that whole plant based solution with half of them saying that they would eat these products more um, if they had the same nutritional content as meat. We're also seeing generational um, differences in this space. Um, so boomers tend to embrace plant-based because they think it's better for them in terms of plant, uh, heart health, whereas the younger generations are embracing it for planet health reasons. And these younger groups are also more pro-science and so um, they are more GMO positive um, because they know that we're going to need science to get out of the mess we're in, right? We just saw that with, with COVID as well. Um, and it's interesting to see what Impossible Foods is doing. So they use GMO, um, they use heme, um, and they have put out, uh, if you go on their website, they've put out this guide called The Birds and the Trees, and it's telling teenagers how to talk about their parents, how to talk to their parents about climate change, uh, very akin to how um, the non-smoking advocates targeted kids to convince their parents. And so far, we've seen um, most of the innovation in plant-based in dairy and the meat space, but there's a lot of gaps out there still. So desserts, um, bakery, and snacks as well. Beyond Meat just in the U.S. launched this uh, jerky product, and it's a, it's a shelf-stable uh, snack product. 
We also believe that uh, seaweed is about to make waves. And certainly when I walked around the floor this morning, I saw a lot of uh, seaweed products as well. It's progressively lost its ick factor because it's used in Asian food. We also have seaweed snacks that kids have grown up with. Uh, so we think that uh, it, this is also going to be big. It's easy to cul cultivate. It's high in protein. We just saw an algae milk launched uh, in Singapore. And unlike all the water that goes into making almond milk, um, you know, it uses microalgae fermentation tanks and uh, basically uses the waste byproducts as production fuel. So it's very sustainable. And we're also seeing the world's biggest com companies like Unilever and Tyson investing in this area. And investment in 2021 was up 36%. So this is definitely coming on strong. So if you have a plant-based op option, how can you formulate and position it to appeal to your target demographic, understanding that they're looking for slightly different things? Is there an opportunity to expand to some different categories out there? Um, and if you're already using a high-grade pr uh, protein source, call it out. And finally, you know, hopefully you can find that sweet spot between better for me and better for the planet. So many legacy businesses are still built around that traditional shopper path to purchase. But again, with COVID, as I said, we saw e-commerce catapults, you know, five to 10 years in the future. And if you think about it, when you shop online, the digital space has really perfected that one-click shop. I can go in, I can do my meal planning, I can find recipes, meal solutions, and then order all the ingredients with one click. So that is really hard to replicate when you go in store. It really falls apart. If you look at tr traditional retail, it's still organized around traditional categories, right? If you go walk up and down those aisles, they don't often, they're not solution focused, right? Uh, they are category managed focused. So, you know, there's a lot of people saying retail is dead. I don't believe that. I believe bad retail is dead. Um, so grocery really needs to re-engineer itself, in my opinion, working from the shopper backwards and really try to um, upgrade that customer experience. Why are we going into stores now? We're going for inspiration and ideas. And food is sensory, so we need to be doing more about that and engage all the consumer senses. So most consumers are walking around shopping with, with, a, with a smartphone. So how can you integrate that into the shopper journey? Um, we see Snapchat has just uh, added an AI-powered uh, food scanning recognition feature that allows users to scan the food items, get recipe suggestions, and more information about the food. And I've got a link there. Um, please check it out. It's uh, called Vincent, and it's an AI voice-enabled avatar, and it helps customers select the right wine for the occasion in a really fun and engaging way. Uh, probably the best use of uh, AI uh, technology and robots I've seen. And I believe consumers are going to continue to outsource their utilitarian staples like paper towels, toilet paper, who enjoys shopping for that, right? Um, and uh, do that online and leave their in-store purchases for more pleasurable experiences and inspiration. And in fact, we've seen a 31% growth in uh, CPG products being purchased on subscription in the past 12 months. So this is indeed happening. And the bottom there, some of you may know California's uh, Erewhon. Uh, there are seven stores uh, in California. Uh, it certainly doesn't look like a grocery store. They're beautiful, they're all organic, um, they're sort of like an elevated Whole Foods, and you have to pay $200 US to have a subscription to shop there. And uh, at the top, this is out of Australia, it's a subscription model uh, for, pay for toilet paper called Who Gives a Crap? Uh, they're a B corporation, they give 50% of their profits um, to build toilets. Uh, in the underdeveloped world, and they claim that that is the modern invention that saved the most uh, lives uh, uh, versus anything else. So the majority of consumers don't want physical stores to disappear, um, but they do expect more convenient, seamless, ordering, shopping experiences. Uh, so how can you bring that together for them? And how can you also play to the consumer's senses and elevate uh, the in-store experience so that they do want to come out of their homes? And how can you rethink that whole path to purchase? 
So blurring the lines, we've certainly seen um, hybrid was probably one of the words of the year uh, in terms of hybrid shopping, hybrid working, um, but I think it applies across the whole food ecosystem as well. Nobody's staying in their lane anymore, uh, and everybody's trying to solve for the same daily meal occasions. And we've seen uh, the rise of the grocer with grocery stores adding indoor agriculture, right? You can actually see in some cases vertical farms, uh, your herbs and lettuces cut fresh. Um, fresh City Farms is out of Toronto. They actually started as an urban farm, and now they have um, eight brick and mortar stores that specialize in local products and produce. Um, Costco, they own a, a poultry processing plant. Um, Walmart has gotten into the shipping to make sure uh, that they get their flow of goods going. Um, Freshy, uh, QSR, they just bought a Natura Market, um, which is an online health and wellness um, retailer. And uh, they did that to make sure they're well positioned to meet the next generation of customers where they are. And we also have just seen the launch of Amazon's um, What to Eat feature on Alexa. And so it will give users recommendations for restaurants, prepared items, recipes with ingredient ordering from, from Whole Foods as well, and meal kits. And it'll customize it again based on your own food preferences. Uh, so when you're thinking about this, what complementary goods and services could you provide to make your customer's life easier or better? And what could forward or backwards vertical integration look like for your business and make sure you think outside your lane. So cultivating your inner garden. What we're seeing is that link between gut health and wellness just continues to grow the research behind it. First we had probiotics, which was the good bacteria. Then we had prebiotics, that was the fiber that fed the probiotics. Now we have postbiotics, and that's really um, the waste product from those pro probiotics. So think of it as upcycling on a micro scale. And we're seeing um, interest in postbiotics, which may be a word you hadn't heard of until today, up almost 400% over last year. Um, searches on Google for microbiome up 250%. And we've seen some new launches in the last couple of months. Uh, you can see uh, Baby Bell just launched a probiotic uh, in the U.S. claiming to be the first functional dairy snack. And uh, Olipop uh, is a premium ready-to-drink sparkling beverage uh, that supports digestive health. And again, you know, all the research is showing that a healthy gut is, goes beyond just healthy digestion, right? It's linked to the, the gut-brain axis. Um, and as we're learning more and more about this, consumers um, are also wanting to find out more and more. So you've seen consumers traditionally pay a lot of money for um, DNA research, 23andMe. Um, now we're starting to see the same thing for our gut biome. And it turns out that you know, it's, it's the gut bacteria that may differentiate us more than our DNA. Uh, so Viome is a company uh, where you can send a fecal sample and it will give you recommendations on what you should eat to improve your gut biome. And Unilever uh, just announced a research partnership with Holobiome. And Holobiome has one of the largest human biome collections in the world. And together they're going to study how specific food ingredients interact with key gut bacteria to, to develop new food and drink products that are healthier for our gut brain axis. So, you know, perhaps what we thought about nutrition is kind of not really that one size fits all. We are all consuming things the same way, digesting them the same way. I think it's really going to come down to how unique our gut biome is. So I would expect more functional foods with gut health claims and a continued rise in fermented foods that, that we've seen. So think about, you know, are there some claims that you can make? You know, are you high in fiber? Do you support gut health? Uh, so make sure that you're calling that out on PAC as well. So when we wrote this, we knew infl food inflation was coming, um, especially as the world opened up. So during the pandemic, we took some of that discretionary income that we had from not traveling, eating out, and we put it into more splurge experiences. We traded up to prime, prime rib, right, at the supermarket. Now that things are opening up, we have more places to put our money, but, you know, food... Um, 
inflation has gone even higher than, than what we expected. Um, and so we think we're going to see um, a real high, low, and squeezing of the middle. So a lot of those convenient food delivery options that we spent on, those meal kits we spent on uh, during the pandemic, now that things are getting tighter, um, we may um, stop doing that as well. Um, we also were, during COVID, doing one, one uh, shop, grocery shopping, and we've seen the numbers, like 40% of people now are shopping at a discount grocery at least once a week. That's up from 37% year ago. And if you look at dollar stores, 24% of people are shopping at dollar stores at least once a week for groceries. Uh, and that's up from 20% year ago. And those are Canadian numbers. Um, when I talk about the high-low trend, what I'm really talking about uh, is something that started in fashion. So the idea of I'd go to Joe Fresh or The Gap to get a T-shirt, and I'd pair it with a designer blazer um, as a way of um, you know, sp splurging and saving. But I think we're going to start to see consumers doing the same thing with food. So will you scrimp on certain things, but then splurge on a high-end olive oil um, to really elevate that overall experience? Will you move to private label for some product categories as well? You know, we know in Canada that consumer perception of private label is, is really quite positive. They see it as close to, if not better, in a lot of categories to the national brand. So again, are you going to see that middle of the market, that mushy middle, get squeezed with this? Um, will those meal kits that you know, made sense during the pandemic and had really a second life, are they going to go away and instead we're going to go to the grocery meal kits or those high-end chef meal kits for special occasions? And again, how can you provide innovation at both ends of, of the spectrum uh, for consumers? And our last trend this year, it's the first time we included it, uh, pet trend, because we've really seen that line between human and pet food really blur. Um, the other reason to think about pet is historically, in past uh, times of recession, this has been the most resilient category. Uh, and uh, thanks to COVID, pet adoptions have been growing at record levels. So there are now more pets in Canada than kids, right? That's a big opportunity. Uh, so first, we saw Ben and Jerry's last year in the US. They uh, jumped in with a line of doggy desserts that used the same ingredients as their plant-based products. But the interesting thing here is they are actually shelled in the same place as the human. So you go in, treat yourself, treat your pet. Uh, so that's interesting. Uh, you can also, the also, Interesting thing to me is you've got a lot of food companies out there that also have pet food divisions. So think Nestle, General Mills, Smuckers. Um, so Nestle owns Purina, and what did they just launch? Uh, one dog food for the microbiome with microbiome balance. So you're really seeing what's good for me is good for Fido. The other thing we know about pets, very meat intensive, they have a huge carbon paw print. And it's estimated that they consume 20% of the world's meat. And I talked about how millennials and Generation Z make buying decisions based on their um, values. And so there's this new term uh, that's called flexi dog doggian, which talks about these plant forward dog parents. Um, Wild Earth was just launched in Walmart in the US nationally, uh, and it is chickpea-based superfood for dogs. And the global vegan pet food market forecast to grow from US uh, 9 billion to 17 billion by 2028. I also think this is a good place for those insect and mealworm proteins, which I don't think are going to come into human foods, um, but they have a lower um, footprint. And a lot of dogs actually have issues uh, in terms of allergies and meat. So I think that's a great place for some of those alternate um, proteins that have been trying to get a foothold. Um, and we're even seeing companies like Hills, which is owned by Colgate Palmolive, um, they're developing uh, lab-based meat uh, proteins as well. Um, so I think with the humanization, um, there are opportunities for you to perhaps extend into this 
area. We know that only 13% of dog owners exclusively serve, um, uh, feed their dogs kibble, so I think there's an opportunity to move there as well. So what opportunities can you see for your four-footed animals? Um, we know that pet food really drives grocery sales. Not only is it recession-proof, but it's a big traffic driver. Um, so, you know, can you think beyond just that plant uh, pet food aisle uh, where a lot of people don't even walk down? And can you look at how can you add things um, in other parts of the store? So, uh, a little bit about what Nourish can do. I want to remind you that English, French, uh, hard copies, if you want them, you can also download it. Um, and I think we've got some time, hopefully, uh, to take some questions. Yeah, we're good. Excellent. Uh, that's the website if you want to download thi uh, this year's as well as the pa past couple of years and see, you know, if we're smoking crack or not. Uh, and that's my uh, email, my phone number. I'm here all three days. I'm doing uh, Judging an Innovation Award tomorrow. I'm doing a couple of panels tomorrow. And the next day, I'm in the Innovation or the Expert Hub uh, talking to folks. But right now, I want to... Uh, Get some comments, questions.